Hello and welcome to section 3 of chapter 37 of the American Pageant, the Eisenhower era. We're looking at the uh, continuing Cold War through a cultural upheaval. We're going to wrap up the 1950s and get in a little bit into the 1960s today. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, pictured here is uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who became the leader of the Soviet Union after Stalin died in 1953. Um, continuing Cold War policies, the U.S. sent troops to Lebanon in 1958 to protect them from communism, which was a part of the Eisenhower Doctrine, that they would help and aid the Middle East to resist communism, which is a small, kind of more specified version of the Truman Doctrine, where we're going to help any country in, in resisting communism throughout the world. Uh, now, Khrushchev and Eisenhower, they actually met in 1955 in Geneva, Switzerland, and figured out pretty soon that they're both bald. They're both uh, old dudes who liked, um, you know, leading their countries and were war heroes. And so they actually got, got along a little bit. Uh, and so this kind of changes the nature of the Cold War in, in Eisenhower's second term. Uh, they talked about a peaceful coexistence, which is very much more different than John Foster Dole's uh, the brinkmanship, the massive retaliation, you know, of pushing the Soviets to the brink, to uh, threatening to nuke and obliterate everyone, talking about the United States and the Soviet Union could actually get along and coexist. Uh, they would compete, but they wouldn't compete with war. They would avoid war, but still compete globally. Uh, each leader planned to visit each other's country. Uh, and then they had a Paris summit planned in 1960 to kind of talk about things to settle down the Cold War. Uh, and so it looked like things were really turning a corner in the late 50s in terms of the Cold War and better relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, Khrushchev came to the United States in 1959 for a 10-day visit. Uh, he toured the country, uh, was infatuated with pig farms. Somebody took him to a pig farm and he thought that was the neatest thing and was hanging out with the pigs and wallowing in the mud. In fact, when he went back to the Soviet Union, uh, started his own pig farms, he would butt. He was denied uh, access to Disneyland, which you're probably wondering, why couldn't he go to Disneyland? I mean, think about it. It's because he's communist. No, actually, they couldn't provide security on short notice for him and his wife was the official reason, but maybe Walt Disney didn't like communists. Uh, and seeing things were looking good. Uh, Eisenhower planned on visiting the Soviet Union in 60, 60, uh, 1960. Uh, and then there's the U-2 spy plane incident where a U-2 spy plane on May 1st, 1960 was shot down over the Soviet Union. It's a U.S. plane. They fly at extremely high elevations. They're not thought that they could actually shoot these planes down. Uh, if they are shot down, the pilots are supposed to, supposed to kill themselves. Uh, and so the Soviets are very upset. They can't believe the United States did this. They felt betrayed. The U.S. is denying everything. We're, we're not involved. It's not our plane. What are you talking about? You're making this up. It's fabricated, fake news, whatever you want to call it. And they said, really, well, we have your, uh, your pilot, Francis Gary Powers, survived, and he did not commit suicide. And so the U.S. was caught red-handed. Eisenhower admitted everything, he apologized, he took full responsibility, but because of this, his trip to the Soviet Union was called off. The Paris summit never takes place. Eventually, Francis Gary Powers is exchanged with another Soviet prisoner uh, in the, the movie Bridge of Spies with Tom Hanks. A uh, pretty good movie in Berlin, uh, or later in the 60s. Um, so the Paris summit's talks, they broke down. Uh, you have a picture here of Eisenhower and Khrushchev and their wives meeting in their uh, Khrushchev's visit to the United States in 1959. Uh, here's Khrushchev uh, hugging Castro, which we'll get to here a little bit. Uh, and then in a United Nations speech, he famously uh, took his shoe off and banged it on the desk and said, we will bury you, uh, which that, that that's kind of hardcore. You can see the shoe here. He claims he was fixing his watch and was trying to fix it, um, but I'm not sure how the shoe ended up on the table. So, Latin America. As I previously mentioned in other videos, the United States meddled a lot because of the Truman Doctrine in places and, and helped uh, overthrow communist powers. Uh, the CIA helped overthrow the government of Guatemala in 1954. Uh, and then in 1959, right under the noses of the United States, 90 miles to the south, Fidel Castro overthrew Florencia Batista in Cuba. Um, the United States had substantial investment in Cuba. It was a tourist destination, and so this was a big shock to the U.S. Castro, who had socialist leanings, was not a full-fledged communist yet. Um, he did seize foreign-owned properties, hotels, and other businesses like that after the United States cut sugar imports. He then comes to the United States uh, for an impromptu visit. He just shows up unannounced, tries to come to the United States, and wants to meet with Eisenhower. Without proper planning, without all the back channels of the State Department ahead of time, uh, Eisenhower refused. In fact, he went golfing instead. 
Um, and so really what it does is it pushes this, the Cubans into the arms of the Soviet Union. Uh, they become more and more socialist uh, and push towards communism. Eventually, Cuba becomes a full communist dictatorship, which is after the Bay of Pigs invasion, which is more Kennedy. Uh, we'll come back to that. Eisenhower cuts diplomatic ties with Cuba, and the formal trade embargo with Cuba was established in 1961. Uh, the U.S. would not trade anything with Cuba until, from 1961 through the Ob Obama administration. Uh, it was under the Ob Obama administration that the embargo was lifted and travel restrictions were lifted. Americans could travel and have tourism in Cuba again. Uh, President Trump has set, since rescinded the travel uh, to Cuba. I'm not sure what's going on with the uh, embargo. So a nice little segue uh, into the election of 1960. The Republicans nominate Vice President Richard Nixon. The Democrats nominate the young, charming senator from Massachusetts, uh, John F. Kennedy, who at the time was only 43 years old, which is, sounds old to you, but to presidential candidates, I mean, compared to the ones we have in 2020, he's super young. Uh, now, Kennedy is a Catholic, which all the way in 1960 is still an issue. There's only one American president who's ever been a Catholic, and it was John F. Kennedy. Uh, so John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a little background, he's from one of the most wealthy and powerful families in the U.S., uh, arguably one of the closest things the U.S. has to a royal family is the Kennedy family. His father, Joseph, was a powerful businessman. Uh, he was an ambassador to Britain. He made lots of money um, before and after the Great Depression. Uh, he sold most of his stocks before the crash and then bought up new stocks after the crash, made a lot of money bootlegging. While he's an ambassador to Britain, the Kennedy family travels there. And so John Kennedy gets to kind of experience the world and, and travel abroad and, you know, kind of see different places and different cultures. Uh, now, when World War II broke out, Kennedy served in the Navy uh, in uh, the Pacific in World War II. Uh, he was a part of PT-109. Uh, famously, his boat was sunk or hit by a torpedo. He saved a crew member, uh, swimming him through shark-infested waters. And because of that, he had injuries the rest of his life. Uh, he comes back. He's a war hero. He's, he's smart. He's rich. He's elected a congressman from Massachusetts in 1946, senator in 1952. Uh, he wrote a book called Profiles and Courage, which was a Pulitzer Prize-winning book about World War II. He's the only president to ever win the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he was re-elected to Senate in 1958 and then ran for president in 1960. Uh, here's John here and his brother Robert and then Ted or Theodore Kennedy, John F. Kennedy in the war, and then Nixon versus Kennedy in the first televised debates, which we'll get to here in a second. So the election, um, you have the first TV debates, and, and this is very famous. It's been talked about a lot in history. Uh, on the first debate, Nixon refused to wear makeup. I'm not wearing that stuff. <laughs> Uh, and so Kennedy said, yeah, I'll wear makeup. And so on television, Nixon looked tired. He looked sick. He didn't look good. He just kind of looked, ugh. Kennedy looked good. He was charming. He's handsome. And so people that, you know, there were some polls that went out in 1960. People that watched the first debate said Kennedy won. Uh, people who listened to it on the radio said Nixon won. There's several other debates after this in which Nixon wears makeup and he looks fine. But that first debate made a big impression. Uh, and so television and image becomes a much more important thing in the presidential elections because of TV. In one of the closest elections in history, um, Kennedy wins by 0.2 to 0.3 percent, depending on uh, whatever figures you get. Uh, he did help Martin Luther King Jr. out of jail because of a sit-in in 1960, and some people think that pushed him over the top. It helped he had a Southern running mate in Lyndon Johnson, a 27-year-old a or 27-year vet of Congress uh, from Texas who pulled in a lot of Southern votes. Uh, Kennedy won 49.9 to 49.6 percent of the vote in the popular vote. The Electoral College is a much wider spectrum, uh, and it was suspicious because Joseph Kennedy, you know, there's some suspicious things that happened in Massachusetts. He was once quoted as saying, get as many votes as you need. I'm not paying for a landslide. But Nixon um, conceded. He could have demanded a recount. He conceded the election. He went back to, to California. Um, actually runs for governor of California in 1962 and loses. Famously says you won't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. Uh, and then makes his comeback in 1968. So here's the electoral map of 1960. Uh, you can see there's a third candidate uh, who took some votes in the South, uh, Byrd, um, but Kennedy still won. It's kind of all over the place. This isn't as regional as it usually is. So on his way out, Eisenhower uh, was economically prosperous. The 50s were a really good time for the economy. You added Alaska and Hawaii to the, to the Union in 1959. He successfully integrated democratic reforms, the New Deal and the Fair Deal, into the American lifestyle. He didn't overturn them. 
and became kind of part of the way of life. Uh, on his way out, in Eisenhower's farewell address, he says, beware of the military-industrial complex. That basically, um, defense contracts, the people that make guns and planes and tanks, they can control foreign policy and don't let them do that through the arms race. Uh, and so maybe he had a little bit of, of say, or maybe he was correct in this because lobbyists and, and things like that and U.S. defense budget is, it's enormous. It's one to two trillion dollars a year the U.S. spends on the military, which is more than the next 20 nations combined, their defense budgets. This is a PBS video. You can check that out on your own. Uh, and so then finally with culture, uh, New York becomes the art capital of the world after World War II. Uh, you have Jackson Pollock who developed an abstract expressionalism in the 1940s and 1940s and 50s where you just splatter paint wherever. It's probably a little more detailed like that, but a lot of people like to do Jackson Pollock style paintings. Uh, American architecture progresses after World War II. You get many skyscrapers that were created in the modernist or international style, which is kind of the birth of the modern American city. I'll show you a picture in a little bit. Um, some big um, writers, pre-war realist Ernest Hemingway published and wrote The Old Man in the Sea in 1952, which he won the Nobel Prize for. John Steinbeck, another pre-war writer, wrote graphic portrayals of American society. He wrote East of Eden. He wrote Travels with Charlie. He won the Nobel Prize in 1952. Joseph Heller publishes uh, Catch-22 about World War II in 1961, which gained really in popularity once the U.S. really gets into Vietnam in the 1960s. Uh, you have poetry and playwrights, which were flourishing throughout the post-war era. Uh, and books by black authors were becoming bestsellers. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man was a big popular book in 52, 53. He won the National Book Award for that. Uh, and then led by William Faulkner, there's like even a, a Southern Renaissance in authorship and literary re renaissance of Southern works. Uh, here's Hemingway in all his glory and hunting in 1953. This is international style, which is pretty much every downtown in the United States today. Here's John Steinbeck and Ralph Ellison here. And then lastly, not everybody was down with the conformity and, you know, hunky-dory, let's, you know, Ozzie and Harriet kind of look of the 1950s. The beat generation grows, uh, largely because of Allen Ginsberg. Uh, he publishes his book, Howl, in 1955, which sparked the movement. It was obscene. It was in your face. It had a lot of cursing and a lot of uh, lewd things and so it was actually was um, there was a trial over the obscenity in it and because of that it gives a national spotlight to the beats and so the beat generation rises out of this you have Jack Kerouac who uh, writes On the Road which is a popular book about traveling across the country and living the ultimate freedom not being bound by the constraints of society uh, of, of what America says you should do to truly be you know, out there and do your own thing uh, he wrote that a weariness to all forms of modern industrial state and so there's a rebellion against conformity in the 1950s, which largely paves the way for the counterculture of the 1960s, uh, for the rise of hippies and a lot of the folk move, move movement that goes on in the 60s. Um, they talked about the isolation of American society, that Americans are, with their little white picket fans in the garages, are sticking to themselves. They're not out there enjoying life and, and you know, being out there like they should and having a real freedom. Uh, and like I said, it helped spawn the counterculture culture movement of the 1960s. That's all I have for this. If you have any questions, let me know. I hope you learned something.